extent I've had training. Uh, it was on the AV mute. Ah. You may have just turned it off. I might have just turned it off. <laughs>
we did hear some comments and we tried to incorporate your comments from uh, the last session into our presentation and we'd be very interested to hear what else you would like us to include in the third session that we're going to have in November. Um, so for today, we're going to focus a little bit more about the MPO business at the CCRPC, uh, talk a little bit more about the role of the Transportation Advisory Committee, the TAC, uh, talk a little bit about the M more about the MPO process. We started last time around, but you know, just <coughs> a little deeper uh, this time around, and uh, uh, just discuss high level and briefly because we can spend, you know, like hours discussing all these different programs and plans, but we're going to just touch upon them briefly, the major responsibilities, MPO responsibilities of this board, which is the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, our long-range plan, the MTP, uh, the Transportation Improvement Program, our TIP, the Unified Planning Work Program, which is our UPWP, which we have every year, uh, in our public participation plan. So we're going to just focus on those uh, four responsibilities. The MPO has many more responsibilities, but those are the major ones. So the nitty gritty about the MPO. So when this board conducts an MPO business, the voting power, it has 24 votes. Let me just put it that way. Each municipality has one vote ex except Buell's score for MPO business. Uh, except Burlington that has four, Colchester has two, and South Burlington has two. Veterans also has one vote, and uh, that is based on population, uh, you know, our voting power and the weights that we have. And Essex essentially and has two, but it's split between the Exactly, and that's the point right there, that, you know, Essex Junction has one, Essex Town has one, but, you know. But when I'm not here, Jeff's an alternate for me. So Lots of yes. Yeah. And he I mean, votes. Yeah, but he gets two votes. It's two votes. But he gets two votes. Yes. <clears throat> and he uses them. And Buell Gore, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but Buell's Gore. Buell's Gore, their transportation budget has a special relationship with VTrans. And that's part of the reason that they don't get a vote. I think so, yes. <clears throat> that is correct. Is that true for all the boards, I assume, the unincorporated towns? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the governor appoints the supervisor of the gorge. Does that also correlate with what constitutes a quorum? So does... Very good. Oh. That is a great question, Barbara. And it takes us to the second slide. <laughs> Thank you so much for asking that. <laughs> but before we get there, uh, just the MPO business. What is the MPO business, right? Some of the MPO business, you know, uh, that, you know, this RPC, CCRPC board uh, executes is... Basically, you vote on our plans, right? Your MTP, our TIP, our uh, PP, the public participation plan. Uh, you also vote on specific policy directions and specific actions. Like we asked, uh, uh, we uh, revised our functional classification of the county recently in the spring. And we sent that request to veterans and FHWA. We also talk about the national highway system. We're going to be talking today about performance measures and you know voting on the targets. So that is all MPO business. Anything that has with, to do with transportation in the county, planning in the county, uh, that uses federal funding and uh, uh, the quorum. You asked Barbara. So the, basically, to have a quorum, we have to have 13 of the 24 votes. But in order to actually execute any of the MPO business, you have to have quorum, which is 13 out of the 24 present, and the majority of the municipalities need to vote in favor of something to amend or adopt a plan or an action. Is that clear? Okay. Um, for, so for the rest of the CCRPC uh, you know, work that we do, uh, we just basically, each board member has one vote. The majority and the quorum is when you have, well, the quorum is when you have the majority of the municipal, uh, municipalities in Chilean County, including Beals Gore now, and some of the regional uh, board members, excluding the transportation ones. So VTrans is not included in this. That constitutes a quorum, the majority of that. And for, uh, for any municipal plan and the planning process, 
only municipal board members vote on that. Those are the kind of the difference between the MPO and the CCRP, the rest of the CCRPC, the non-MPO uh, work that we do here. Just a little clarification for those of you Please that do. aren't here every month. Uh, the regional board members are uh, Justin for socioeconomic housing, Don for conservation and the environment. Ag, we just pointed yeah, one. Um, and then uh, IBM Bakley for uh, ac yeah, economy. So those are, we have four regional kind of sector board members. Uh, so now Peter is going to talk to us a little bit more about the Transportation Advisory Committee's role. So Peter, you want to, you have the <coughs> clicker? Okay. So we're going to take a little sideways now and go back to the little process. So rather than talk about voting and, and boring things like that, <coughs> you know, the, the RPC has, if you read the bylaws, I'm not sure if you have or not, but there are six established subcommittees within the bylaws. I'm only going to talk about one, the Transportation Advisory Committee. <coughs> The one that focuses obviously on transportation and MTO business. Um, and anything related to transportation um, that we feel needs to be uh, an issue that has to go to the board, the, uh, the TAC will discuss and make a recommendation to the board. The TAC does have one exclusive right that the board does not have. It's the third bullet here. We can actually make a decision on uh, hiring consultants. It was uh, established in bylaws quite a few years ago. So we make a decision at the TAC level who to hire for whatever task. Generally, we meet monthly. Um, first Tuesday of the month, except for a town meeting day in March, which screws everything up, then we meet on Wednesday after. And on average, we'll meet 10 times a year, um, and kind of corresponding with the board. And the board takes at least August off, maybe another month, and we'll try and do the same. same. Occasionally, we'll have no items in the agenda, so we'll take a month off. But on average, it's 10 times a year. Um, we have the chair of the, um, uh, the TAC is the public works director of Colchester, Brian Osborne, has been. He was elected by the TAC several years ago, and no one else has come forward to want to take that seat. <laughs> and I think the rest of the TAC is very happy to have him sitting there. So it's probably going to be a, a happy relationship for a while. <clears throat> a little bit more about it. Um, we do have one board member on the TAC. That's Barbara Elliott, sitting over here. Um, all the municipalities of Chittenden County have a representative as well. Normally that's either the public works director or the town or city planner, the road foreman, or the town administrator. That's kind of it. There may be an exception or two in that. We also have VTrans at the table as well as the Federal Highway Administration. And then we have our other modal partners like uh, Green Mountain Transit, the airport, um, CATMA, and SSDA. And then we have these other interests that are uh, on the board as well. <coughs> Bike and ped, rail, business, disabled. You can see them all here. I do want to note that we don't have all 31 people coming to every monthly meeting, especially in those um, interest um, areas that, um, at the bottom there. Uh, it's, it's kind of sketchy in terms of people showing up and having people participate. But that's what we have, and we do get on an average, I think 20 people per, um, per meeting. So we get a good representation. The municipalities especially are very well represented, I'd say. Uh, a normal TAC meeting, again, happening the first Tuesday of the month, or the, or the bottom bullets there. Whenever we're, we're uh, amending or adopting a new metropolitan transportation plan, the TAC will have a number of meetings related to hearing about the changes, giving presentations, making recommendations. The second bullet is something that happens nearly every month. Uh, Christine's going to talk in a little bit about the transportation <coughs> improvement program, that four-year list of projects that we all agree with v Trans will be funded. That particular document gets amended, sometimes monthly, so all those amendments will go through the TAC with a recommendation to come to you, the board. They'll hear presentations on various technical scoping or engineering studies. Um, for instance, uh, I think it was last month we had a uh, an update on the Winooski Bridge, uh, yeah, a major connection between two of our larger cities. Presentation on that. And so that's a pretty typical part of the agenda. I mentioned already they get to select consultants. Every year we go through this um, project prioritization. If you've been around this table for one or two or more years, you're familiar with that process. The TAC first hears about it, and then it comes to the for recommendation. And then we hear about planning activities that go on amongst our partners. The Agency of Transportation, I think next month we have two items on the agenda related to VTrans. We heard 
a couple of months ago about their Long Ridge Transportation <coughs> Plan. And we'll hear from GMT on their planning activity, like their next-gen plan that they the board approved. And with all the emphasis in, in funding going into water quality and transportation, we're more and more discussing water quality and transportation issues at the TAC level. That's a pretty common item on the agenda as well. So, so they in the minutes, sir, in their last month meeting, they actually got involved in selecting the preferred alternatives in, a, in the Winooski study, right? The tactic? Yeah, they said they, I thought they, I read in there that they, that the Transportation Advisory Committee recommended that alternatives four and five be used. I thought that was what I read in the minutes, unless I oh, just read it. that may be related to the Winooski Bridge project? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the TAC didn't take action yeah, the, on that. Yeah, no, that was just a presentation. But it was just a presentation. Maybe I could we can check the minutes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Sorry. The, the advisory committee recommends that both alternatives oh. four and yeah. five move forward as yeah. locally recommended the alternatives. The right. project right. advisory committee, no, oh, okay. just, that was advisory made committee. To, to the TAC. Yeah. The, the TAC took no action. Sorry. So Maybe a project to... advisory committee is not part of the TAC? They're just for a project? We, we set up project advisory committees for virtually every scoping report we do. Right. Okay. Um, and includes some TAC members, obviously. Uh, yes. Some yes. 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 They, okay. They do. All right. Yeah. yeah so they don't so get involved in selecting or recommending alternatives, but they do review decisions of project advisory committees? Um, well, in this case, it was just an information item. Okay. Just letting them know about their project. We okay. didn't ask for any consensus but opinion or recommendation. It's very infrequent, fr frankly, that they have okay. to see the results of a yeah. scope and study, mm -hmm. for better or worse. Um, <laughs> any. Questions on the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee? Because I'm about to turn it over yeah. to since, since we're doing an orientation, I'm permitted yeah. to ask a really dumb question. Uh, Please do. <laughs> so, in regards to project prioritization, uh, I was wondering about this this afternoon. Are there, I wonder how much discretion the TAC has in establishing those priorities, or if there are metrics separate to that that really drive it for the most part yes the last there are lots of metrics that drive that and the tech gets to consider that christina said a more about this and i'll defer to you so they kind of review what comes out of that that process and they concur with it and make a recommendation with the to the board there was a methodology that was went through the tag at some point yeah there's a methodology for that and i think um the comments that usually get made would be about sco scoring criteria specifically. Um, there might be some factors about the project that they think should be slightly different. So they do have input, and um, if the TAC agrees, they can make changes. Which Amy then ignores. No. <laughs> um, the one other thing I'll just um, I have to say it. You just know occasionally, that. you know, we, we talk about the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, but there are also some sub plans that we do, like it might be a park and ride plan or we did the bike and ped plan a year or so ago, or the ITS plan. So there's a, some other sub-element plans I think we kind of consider part of the metropolitan, the overall plan, but they may not be on the same schedule, so they may come up in interim years. <coughs> um, yeah, so if you're done with the attack and throw it over to Jason. All right, so moving, moving up a level to the table that you all sit at, uh, the MPO board, um, we have four main documents that you're responsible for voting on as an MPO. And we briefly touched on those in, our, in the introduction. That's our Metropolitan Transportation Plan, our MTP, our Transportation Improvement Plan, our TIP, our Unified Planning Work Program, our UPWP, and our Public Participation Plan. And these are uh, updated at uh, different intervals. Our MTP being our long range plan is done every five years. And our TIP is our more short range um, planning document that is looking at just uh, for the next four years. And that is typically updated annually. And going down even one more level just to our annual work, work program is the actual projects that we are set to undertake in a given um, fiscal year. And then we have our public participation plan that doesn't have to be updated on a regular interval, um, but it is something we strive to keep rather current and our last version was adopted in 2014. 
And this is just a diagram that's kind of uh, letting you know how each of these documents talk to each other, our public participation plan being a large overarching thing um, that dictates how we uh, communicate these documents to the public. And we have our UPWP and the project development on the left. And that really is a two-way street to our long-range or metropolitan transportation plan. Sometimes projects originate at the UPWP level and move up into our MTP. Sometimes <coughs> projects are conceived at the MTP during the MTP process, uh, especially uh, larger sorts of things like the currently in the works to be underway Interstate 89 study that we're working on. That's something, an example that originated at the MTP level and is now part of our work program. Whereas <coughs> moving into the TIP, things are typically one way from the UPWP into our transportation improvement program. And from there, eventually getting funded and constructed. And last thing I'm going to touch upon is just a little more detail on our long range or metropolitan transportation plan. Um, this looks at at least 20 years. Our current plan is looking out to 2050, <coughs> and that was just adopted this year. And this is a really a visioning exercise <coughs> looking at how do we uh, make our system to be an intermodal system. Um, that will accommodate us well out into the future. This, it, it's, at the same time, it is a visioning exercise. It's also fiscally constrained, so there is a huge financial element to this, so it's not just a pie-in-the-sky plan. And that, I'll take any questions. If not, I'm going to pass the mic. All right, moving right along. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Transportation Improvement Program. For those who were here back in July, we approved our current um, transportation plan, federal fiscal year 19 to 22, beginning October 1st, 2018 through <coughs> September 30th, 2022. So um, we've, we've talked about this just really recently, so just to give a few things. This is a little bit different than um, some of the other studies that we, the MTP, in that these are projects that are to be constructed over a four year time period. So it's a list of actual projects that we expect to be constructed in that time period. Um, it's based on real money that we expect to actually be available, it's this, which is what fiscal constraint means. And um, projects that spend transportation dollars in Chittenden County have to be in the Transportation Improvement Program. This is unique to Chittenden County as an MPO. The rest of the state does not have a similar document. Uh, federal regulations require that it be updated every four years. We have been doing it every year. VTrans does it every year. Um, there's also a state Transportation Improvement Program. I'm going to say something about that in a minute. Um, and it covers the whole county. The map on the bottom is the location of the projects. And <clears throat> we talked the last at the last training about this continuing comprehensive transportation planning process that's carried out cooperatively by the state, the MPO and transit providers, that's language that's out of the federal regulations and we're required to do this. And just the, the a lot of what we do, including the MTP content <coughs> and the TIP content are really spelled out in a lot of detail in the federal regulations. So um, we have to do what the law tells us to, that we have to do. Just to clarify, the TIP is the spending plan. It's not projects that appear in it are going to be constructed over the next four years. It's the projects that are going to receive funding over the next four years. So just to clarify. Yep, yep. and I'm going to make, I'll, I'll make that point. It's more of a spending slide. plan than a construction plan. Um, so multimodal includes transit, includes bike pad, includes um, vehicles, includes a lot of other stuff. Um, there's some um, opportunity for public public involvement in the development of it and it authorizes the obligation of federal funds so this is kind of a, a so to Amy's point um, the tip the obligation is a process that by which the <coughs> funds are set aside for a specific project so um, so it's, it really happens before it's constructed so if you are ready to construct um, this bridge out here or something like that, the FHWA would obligate the funds, they would set it aside, 
this money belongs to this project, and then that money is used to pay down the bills. So it's really, it's, it's not a spending document, as Amy said, it's, it's, a, it's more of a spending <coughs> document. Um, it does, the, the top chart, the bottom chart, is the TIP levels from 2009 to present, and what you can see, the green are airport projects, airport projects are listed in the TIP just for information purposes, we don't have control over those, but the point of this chart is really just to show that it does vary a lot year to year, and that's because it's, it's a dynamic group of projects that are trying to move into construction, so, you know, averages about um, $50 million per year um, in, in the programming, the actual spending is somewhat lower. We can talk about that at another point, but that's probably detail that we don't need to get into right now. Um, and um, it has, yeah, so it's multimodal. What we said before has a whole lot of different types of projects. I just threw this in here. We don't really have to talk about this tonight. We did talk about this a couple months ago, but we have transit projects, we have bike ped projects, we have the exit 16 parking lot <coughs> in the bottom, some intersection work, 15 bronze trace, um, culverts, exit 16 improvements, so a whole variety of projects. And the last point that I'm gonna make is, so there is a tip, talking about that, there's also a STIP, the State Transportation Improvement Program. Those are federal documents that are required by the federal government. And they're planning documents <coughs> that lay out the money to be spent over that time period. There's also the state capital program. And I think from the state's perspective, that's kind of more important than their STIP, because that's what they're actually spending money on. So um, our projects have to be in the capital program, and they have to be in the TIP in order to spend money. Are there any overlaps between TIP and STIP? The, t the TIP is wholly incorporated into the STIP. Oh, the federal okay. regulations require that. So when so a lot of people, we have a lot of confusion about that sometimes. If something's in the TIP, then people say we have to get it in the STIP. It's automatically in the STIP. Okay. As long as V trans are <coughs> Okay? <coughs> Who's next? So the UPWP is perhaps my least favorite acronym that we use. <laughs> <laughs> it stands for Unified, uh, Unified Public Work Program. Unified Planning, planning Program. Planning Program. Yeah, you can get it right. Unified Planning <laughs> There's no fun way to say it. But There's not. It's, it's, where it's, about, it's where the rubber hits the road and what we're doing as staff to help our municipalities. We are an organization of acronyms. That's right. We are. Um, so the UPWP is our annual work program. Uh, we solicit projects from our municipalities that we represent. Um, I'll get to the process in a minute. Um, but it's basically how we implement the adopted vision, goals, and strategies of the ECOS plan. Uh, all the committees come together, the board came together, adopts the ECOS plan, which includes the MTP. And so the UPWP is the way that we identify projects on how we're going to ultimately achieve those uh, livable communities that we all strive for. Um, you can see this nice giant poster that we uh, developed as part of the ECOS plan back here, which you see. Um, but like I said, we're trying to develop those plans and move projects ultimately towards construction. The process itself, it's one of those things that is sort of always uh, happening at some level. Uh, usually from mid to late November, we'll send out our solicitation to everyone uh, in the county and say, we are developing our work program for next year. What are the ideas that you have for your town? We also solicit projects from non-municipal partners to help us, again, achieve those identified goals and strategies in uh, the adopted ECOS plan. We, yeah. Can I just make a point? Um, in the application itself, which goes out you know, Thanksgiving time, uh, and all the municipalities see those that application, there is kind of a, a review within that that says, you know, how is this further a strategy or action of the plan? So that's kind of the crosswalk, you know, they kind of say, oh, this is going to, you know, accomplish X, Y, Z. Um, so that's how we kind of connect the planning document to the this programming application. Right, and we try, um, it's not, I don't like to think of it as a competitive grant program. It's not. It's based on the funding that we have available to help support the municipality. So the you know town sent us the projects that they would like uh, planning assistance with. If they have more than one, we ask that they prioritize and rank them. 
and that will help the UPWP committee, which is another board level committee, um, identify which ones of those that we are able to fund with the planning dollars available, uh, and again, to Charlie's point, to help us uh, meet those adopted goals in the plan. Um, in January, those uh, project requests are due. The UPWP committee meets January, February, March to help sort of organize all of those. Um, we do an eligibility review with Federal Highways and VTrans to make sure that we can use transportation dollars for transportation projects. Um, those documents, the recommended uh, work program comes. Um, we present it to the TAC, the executive committee, the board ultimately uh, adopts and approves it, and we begin work in July. We do a mid-year review in December. Uh, we want to make sure we're staying on track. Some projects take a little bit longer to start than others. So we're able to reallocate some funds if, as, as needed um, to help keep projects moving along. Jason mentioned our public participation plan as sort of that large overarching <coughs> umbrella. Uh, we're a public entity funded with public dollars, so this is really the keystone of all of our efforts. Uh, we have a public participation plan that we typically update every five years. We had a major rewrite in 2014. Um, but, you know, proactive, early, continuous, open, and collaborative. We want people to know about what we're doing. We want to hear from them on how we can do what we're doing better. Um, and there's different levels of involvement <coughs> depending on the type of project that we're working on. For example, uh, in our rewrite in 2014, we are using the spectrum of engagement, uh, which came from a national public participation organization. We thought it fit well and would help us determine uh, what levels of engagement we wanted to do depending on the type of project. For example, um, if we are just putting stuff on the calendar, on our website, if we're putting out a newsletter, that's just forward-facing stuff, right? That's, we're just informing the public about what we're doing. Uh, if we're going to move up the ladder a little bit, we're going to do some consulting. This is sort of a technical <coughs> study. Um, it's not really dependent on public feedback on how we're going to do traffic counts. Um, or run the traffic model, although the, all that is public information, happy to share that, but we don't necessarily need to have a, a number of public meetings to run through those. When we move up to involve, um, this is when we have those project advisory committees that meet and help move projects forward, and, and this is when we really start to have uh, a little bit more public involvement. And when we reach this point, we have a form as a part of our public participation plan that helps our staff and the consultant team, if we're using that, think through the different populations that may be affected by the project and we may want to come up with some different ways to reach out to them, some different ways that we want to hear feedback from them. Not everyone can come to a meeting on Tuesday or Wednesday at 7 o'clock. So we want to come up with some different ways to take advantage of the technology that's there, meet people where they are, um, and in the language that they speak. Um, when we get up to collaborate, this is sort of those bigger plans. We really do have a much larger uh, process. So these projects take a little bit longer. We want to engage them in what we're doing. Um, at the RPC, we really don't have many of the empower level projects. Um, I see those as more of the municipal projects. This is really a citizen-led effort, um, whereas collaborate is sort of lockstep with uh, our process. Um, and as you move up, you these projects, for example, the Winooski Avenue Corridor Study, which were at the collaborate level, that project has already benefited from some of the work at the earlier level. Phase one was a technical analysis, which didn't have a significant amount of public involvement. But now we're at this point where we can <coughs> use that information and really go out more broadly. Who drives that process? Is there somebody in charge of each project that then drives down through those th lines? Well, Depending on the type of project, all right, we can sort of use this to figure out, all right, well, we're just sending MR communications manager some information to put on the website. That's fine. Um, when we do our work program, the UPWP, uh, we go through those projects, and, and you know, some of them just are self-identified as scoping projects or corridor projects, and that will help us provide the framework. I would say most, um, you know, the involve, we sort of play in that space quite a bit. Um, you know, the, the website, the flyers, and ads in the paper, the inform, you know, that's sort of more regular work. Consulting is more of the technical assistance type of project, uh, accounts and so forth. 
um, involve and collaborate are those much bigger projects that um, have a more significant public involvement. So Somebody for wanted each to drive that? Yes. Drive it. So for each project, we have a project manager yeah. from the CCRPC, and yeah. usually we have a municipal yeah. uh, you know, representative that yeah. we collaborate with. So that person, the, the project manager, and we usually have a consultant on board. Mm -hmm. So we all basically, we create a public participation yeah. plan for There's each. There's some competition project. between these projects too, right? Some people push them harder than others. Or, or is this all move along a at the same speed through the whole no, thing? No, I think there are, there are projects that they are much more complex, huh? right? So they have a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more yeah. participation yeah. than others. So that's what Brian was trying to say. Between the involved and the collaborate, there is a difference there. Somebody could be more anxious to get their project through, <laughs> right? And, and they, they can't. Can they move ahead? With, or is, that, is everything moved together? Or? Uh, so they're trying to see what how a project well, really goes. I mean, so there definitely, is a different, definitely different projects move right. at different speeds, particularly within the municipality. Yeah, you know, the municipality may decide to slow down, have more meetings, yeah. more uh, analysis. Yeah, um, but I don't know that they can. It depends on the comfort level, typically, of the select board. If they're if they're voting on a preferred alternative, uh -huh. are they comfortable? Do they have a lot of people yeah. in support or against? You know, so that's what really changes the speed of things and if it's a town level project and i'm not sure if you're asking a different question about like how fast does then it move yeah, if some after we do the study yeah if some how fast really, does it move through v-trans to get yeah, built yeah, yeah is there That's, any way to accelerate a project if, well, if a town really gets excited about it implementation That's a of different the project question. or yeah. planning i mean this is just for planning right we, well we the planning scoping and... can't implement until you plan right right exactly okay, so, so so i'm just wondering how you how you put is is everything moved together and it's all even or can somebody comes in and says <laughs> there's hey, still an animal called locally managed projects where a town can put oh in yeah, kick in their extra ten percent so you can kick in your twenty percent and you can move it and have the management at your town if you want to do that. What's what's the what's the twenty percent you're kicking in? Money? Well, there's shared funding. Uh -huh. Eighty ten ten is most. Oh, projects. I see. I see. And okay. So you could do right. you could do you could pick up the okay. twenty that you could pick up the extra ten and locally manage it. Yeah. 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 So most, um, also, mm -hmm. most of these projects come through our UPWP, uh -huh. right? So, you know, the, the municipalities and our partners <clears> just yeah. basically, you know, so those projects, once they get into the program, they move forward. Yeah. So okay. if that, uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I'm taking a note that maybe we should delve into how a project actually becomes, gets done as Maybe Sounds like a topic well, for next time. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, so my question project. was kind of related to that in a way. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's yeah. so uh, any other. Something uh, to look I forward to November 28th? Is uh, that what it is? Uh, November. Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. So, any other ideas about the November uh, training session? So, our thinking was we can definitely address that, but also we can address some of our actual work here in our UPWP, just a good the actual example. work that we're doing here. And an example you might yes. go through. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. yeah. we'd be happy to do that next time. And we yeah. were thinking on, along those lines, but I want to hear from you if you have an it's other ideas. It's also interesting that, you know, I, I remember there was a time, and George, you may remember this because you've been involved in this organization a long time, as has Mike and Andy and Andrea, if she was here. I remember we used to have to borrow the city of Burlington's light. We had so many people that would come to the January meeting to talk about and putting a project on our UPWP. And oh, we yeah. always had we always had a situation where it felt like a feeding frenzy, okay? <clears throat> and then we had to learn how to say no to about 40% of the projects that got suggested. <laughs> but I don't see that anymore. I don't see well, that happening we anymore. We did a fundamental... Um, Partly because we did a fundamental shift in how we do the UPWP. Because we don't want people to come in with wish lists. We want them to come in with real. Yeah. Well, and we also, because it's central to anything that we do that the municipality be on board, we wanted them to bring the to their municipality right. and see if their municipality is on board with us doing it. Um, and so, uh, for better or worse, yeah. I think that that kind of change in process, we went from uh, you know not getting it all just scatter shot the boys our longest meeting because we'd spend two yep. hours listening to everybody talk about a light on their corner to yeah. a, and also the to a, the, a CCTA route right. the municipalities are doing a really good job I think of, of talking and looking at what they want to do in their municipality and prioritizing it so I think it's made that whole process uh, a 
hopefully more effective, but at least more efficient. But we, we actually lose the creativity of some of the citizens when they what they dream up. Yeah, we still we still get that input, but a lot of it is in writing now, Jeff. So we're getting a lot of comments via email that we share with the municipalities and and their staff for them to think about. Like, hey, do you? You got uh, three suggestions from a resident of yours. Do you want to yeah. do that? Is that a priority? I guess in the age of social media, coming to an actual hearing is old school. Back in the day. And people will we say more things again. on social media than they would if they had to put their face and yeah. mouth behind it. <laughs> a microphone. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. Yeah. I do let us know if you have, if something occurs to you after yeah, tonight that you're thinking like, oh, I, I, I think pizza was a good idea. Do you have an
There was a gavel. Look at that automatic. All right, here. people just getting quiet. Thank you all. Call to order the October meeting of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. Um, are there any changes to the agenda? Hearing none, um, we give an opportunity to members of the public to comment on items that do not appear on the agenda. Are there any members of the public who would like to make such a comment at this time? Move approval of consent agenda. Okay, well, first, is there, is, does anybody want to withdraw back, anything from the... Oh, back off a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Under public comment, I just want to take a minute to introduce our... And the only one still here. New alternate from Lindsay, Abby, Carlisle. Abby. Carlisle. And this is Abby. She'll be sitting on some meetings when she tells me she wants to come and stay home. So. Can hardly wait. <laughs> me too. Anything you want to say? Yeah, I was just, I'm glad to be here. Excited to learn more about this group. Fix your road, fix your roundabout, and we'll be happy. Working on it. So, does anybody wish to remove any items from the consent agenda? Yeah. Hearing none, is there a motion? I already blew it. I'll, I already blew it. I'll move that we approve the consent agenda. Okay. Consent agenda. Consent agenda. And a second? Oh. I thought Jeff, Jeff, well, Jeff, did you? I, I made the motion. <laughs> I was just being difficult again, as usual. No, I just. <laughs> I second. They ended. All right. All right. Until right. so I was rudely interrupted by his former honor. <laughs> All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed. Ayes have it. It's nice how those just move things along. So Approve the minutes with corrections. Is there a second? I'll right. second. Barbara. Catherine, no move over in the yeah move move minutes with Catherine's corrections. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I either I'm either, I'm either slipping or there's it was perfect. Or Bernie's getting better, <laughs> just in time to retire. Any <laughs> any comments, questions, Jeez. changes to the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it. <clears throat> now we have a presentation with respect to transportation survey results. Yeah, Peter will introduce this. Yeah. Um, so a little bit of background on this particular project. We have, going back now almost 20 years, at some regular interval, tried to gather the pulse of what the public in, Tr in Trittenden County felt about transportation issues. Um, we did the first one in 2000, we did one in 2006 and 12, and now 2018. Why six years is pretty interesting. Um, and we tried to do it at five year intervals and missed the first one by a year, so we said, well, I'll we'll stick with six. <laughs> so, anyway, we've tried to replicate the same survey I'm now sure over four different periods. <coughs> we did have a problem with the first one in 2000, so you won't see comparisons to that. But the last three, in 2006, 2012, and the most recent one, we've asked the same questions and gotten the responses from a good sample size that we can extrapolate the, the findings to the entire population of Chittenden County with a certain margin of error. Um, and we're doing that here. Um, and we do this, well, for a couple of reasons. One being, we want to have some idea of what people in the region are thinking about transportation. We have some idea if maybe there's some trends in their thinking, and you'll see in a couple of slides in a minute that there are. Most, however, remain remarkably <coughs> static over time. That's probably not surprising. Um, but it, it's good for our long-range planning, just to have some idea what the public thinks. Um, it's sort of a check on when we do our metropolitan transportation plan. Not that we're trying to match our recommendations to what the public thinks, but we want to have some idea of what they do think, something to consider. So the most recent one was conducted in um, May, April, May this past year, and a little into June. It was done by WBA Research. Kevin Polis is here. He is, works for WBA. He's going to give a presentation on the findings and compare that with some of the previous ones. Steve Bobble is with Stedman Hill, also part of the consultant team on this, and he may chime in on some of this as well. So anyway, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to do this. You have the clicker to do this. So he's going to go over the, the findings from the recent survey, do some of the comparison, and hopefully you're going to find some of this interesting. If you have any comments or questions at any time, please interject. <coughs> hopefully we're going to have an interesting and lively discussion here. Because you are going to see some changes over time in what people think about various strategies. 
I, uh, a couple of notes up front. Um, I don't think anybody wants to sit here and listen to me drone on for 20 minutes um, in silence. Um, if, this is meant to be informal and interactive, so if you have questions, please chime in. Uh, we have a lot of data to go through, and I have not uh, memorized every single number. It's a lot of numbers. So some of my response to your questions might be, I'll have to get back to you on that, uh, which I'm glad to do. Uh, but please, if you have questions, ask. Uh, mm -hmm. Second thing I want to, and this is building off of what Peter just said, is what I am not going to show you here are the facts. Rather, what I'm going to show you here are people's perceptions of the facts. This is what people perceive. So if you see a number here and you think, hey, that's not technically true, this is what people are perceiving things to be. So keep that in mind. This is the public's view and the public in Chittenden County. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to um, slip a little bit to the side, that's okay. Um, we're going to go through um, the methodology real quick we used. Then we're going to talk about system-wide results. From there we're going to talk about uh, the strengths and weaknesses by each of the four major modes and modes in your total county transportation system. That's better. Um, the four major modes we're defining is driving, walking, bicycling, and Green Mountain Transit, public transportation. Um, then we're going to talk about the importance of possible improvements, how people perceive those, and wrap it up with some initial conclusions we came to from the results. Okay, uh, we did a survey of 500 residents of the <coughs> county. Uh, residents were mailed in, a random sampling of residents were mailed an invitation to participate in an online survey. What we did to ensure that people didn't fill out the survey multiple times or what's become too common these days, post it on social media so all the friends can fill it out, is we put a unique password on each invitation, ensuring that the uh, person who filled it out could only fill it out once. The questionnaire itself was 21 minutes long, so 21 minutes on average to complete. As I said, there is a lot of data here. You're only going to get an overview of what's here. We did also weight the results to ensure the results are representative of the entire county. Now, as far as the transportation people are using, um, this is what people use most often. Those are the numbers in green to the left, and what people have used in the past month. Not surprisingly, driving is number one. The majority of people drive. In fact, 84% of people say the driving is the mode of transportation they use most often. Interestingly enough, 16% of people said that they use app-based transportation, your Ubers, your Lyfts. And more so than that 16%, we have 35% of 18 to 34-year-olds who say they've used app-based transportation somewhere in the past month. Now, one other number we wanted to note, more because it lines up with other numbers that we've seen, <coughs> is that there's been a slight drop in GMT usage. It's down to 12% reporting versus 16% in 2012, which... Yeah, if you've seen any statistics come out of Green Mountain Transit over the past couple of years, you've seen that ridership has gone down uh, marginally in those years, especially commuter transportation. The three and four percent numbers you see as used most often is very much in line with analysis that we've done over the years uh, calculating the transit mode share in Chittenden County so that that's, that's a, a good um, emphasis on, uh, on that point. But you do see that among the less frequent users that it's somewhat lower now than it was in 2012. And also remember in 2012 gas prices were at their, their nominal peak, close to four dollars a gallon. So um, some of those infrequent users have dropped off as gas has gotten less expensive. Different economy, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very different economy. All right. The, from here, we ask people to rate their satisfaction with Chittenden County's <laughs> transportation system overall. So keep in mind, this rating is countywide, regardless of whether you live right in the middle of Burlington or if you live out in the farm road. And currently, um, those who are satisfied, 71% of people say they're satisfied. That's actually up from 65% in 2012. The overall increase in satisfaction is largely driven by um, improvements in people's attitudes toward bicycling, and it's also supported by positive results we're seeing by, from Green Mountain Transit and from walking. Those seem to be largely carrying uh, the driving numbers, which are a little bit lower. Now, this next chart I'm going to take a minute on. This isn't even really a chart. It's more of a primer to explain some of the charts you're about to see. 
What we did is we asked people to rate how satisfied they were individually with your four major modes, Green Mountain Transit, bicycling, walking, and driving. And then we asked people a series of attributes within each of those categories and how satisfied they are with each of those attributes. The more satisfied, as you're going to see in the following charts, the more satisfied somebody was with an attribute, the further to the right-hand side of this quadrant you see in front of you they'll be. If you're more satisfied, you'll be further to the right, less satisfied, further to the left. And then we did some additional statistical analysis to determine which of these attributes are having the greatest impact on overall satisfaction. And those you'll see, the ones that have a greater impact on overall satisfaction will appear higher on here. The ones that have only a moderate or little impact on satisfaction will appear lower on here. What does all of that mean? What all that means is this. If somebody is highly satisfied, meaning far to the right, and it has a very large impact on satisfaction, it's higher up, it'll appear in that top right-hand quadrant. It's a strength. People are satisfied with it, and it has a significant impact on satisfaction. It's one of your strengths. You do well at this. With agencies I work with, I normally tell them, interestingly enough, to focus on the top left. These are things that have a significant impact on satisfaction, but you're not doing as well on it. It says it, people are not satisfied. It's a weakness. It's an area you should focus on. Now, in all that being said, I'm not saying you don't focus on anything that falls toward the bottom of the chart. It's not that these are not important. It's just that they're not key drivers. They are not the key drivers that are driving people's satisfaction. And the first example of this is we ask people to rate each of the four modes overall. And you'll notice in the top right corner, you'll see walking. People are satisfied with walking. Now, when we talk about satisfied with walking, we're talking about satisfied with walking countywide. And it has a significant impact on people's overall satisfaction with the area. Um, walking, in fact, is viewed as the county's greatest strength. This was brought up in our discussions. I was thinking about this, so I looked into it. Um, when we talk about satisfaction, um, city residents, 87% of city residents are satisfied with walking in the area, compared to 77% of suburban and rural residents. Other numbers to focus on here, driving. Driving is a flip side. Driving is probably the area's weakness. It has a very large impact on people's satisfaction, but your ratings are not as high on driving. Green Mountain Transit kind of straddles in the middle. It does have a significant impact on people's attitudes, but whether it's a weakness or a strength, it's right on the line where you can define it one or the other. The fourth that's very interesting is bicycling. People's satisfaction with bicycling has been improving over the past 12 years, and it's becoming more and more, and more important to people. Now, first, and I know there's a lot of stuff here, so I'll, I'll save you some trouble and focus on uh, the key attributes. Number one attribute, as far as driving goes, people perceive driving as safe. Um, and it has a significant impact on people's overall satisfaction. Your weaknesses in terms of driving are the conditions of the roads and bridges in the area and neighborhood streets as well. In addition, traffic congestion. So it's a condition of roads and bridges and traffic congestion. That has a significant impact on people's satisfaction, and it's where you're receiving lower ratings. In fact, regarding um, conditions of roads and bridges, only 22% of people are currently satisfied with the condition of roads and bridges within the county. Um, that's actually down from 27% in 2012 and 39% in 2007. That's the condition of roads and bridges. It is the condition, the condition of roads. Condition of them, okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a fair bit of discussion we've had about this. Yeah, yeah. I know there's been work in the area. Uh, one comment is, is when you do work in an area, you're bringing attention to it. So I didn't realize it was a problem until I saw all this construction. That's a possibility. Mind you, that's also uh, conjecture. It's perception of condition. Right. It is not Thank actual you. condition. Guess what led me to want to lead off with that point? <laughs> you're looking at it right there. <clears throat> now. This is interesting, it's a little bit odd because all of these things are appearing on the top of this chart, meaning all of these have an impact on people's satisfaction with Green Mountain Transit. These measures were asked of everybody, whether or not you are part of that 12% of people who ride Green Mountain Transit, 3% who ride regularly. Everybody was asked, what attributes are you satisfied with? And because, <coughs> as I said, people are satisfied, generally satisfied with the system, it does have a significant impact on people's overall satisfaction with your transportation system as a whole, 
but people are having a little time, trouble separating things out as to what's really important to them versus what's not. If we were able to measure this among, among riders, I'm sure we'd see a much greater spread and be able to pull out individual attributes that are critical. Unfortunately, we didn't speak to enough riders to be able to do that. We've seen little change in people's <coughs> satisfaction with Green Mountain Transit over the years. These numbers are very, very stable. Green Mountain Transit's greatest strengths, I mean, again, this is among all county residents. It's seen as safe, the fares are seen as reasonable, and your drivers are seen as courteous. I guess there hasn't been a fare increase in how long now? Probably at least a dozen years, so. so mind you, that do, and don't look at these results as advocating for a fare increase or anything like that. That's a whole different type of research. All I'm saying is that right now people are satisfied with where the fares are, uh, the weaknesses of the system. Getting me uh, to where I need to be, when I need to get there, and it's reliability. Um, I do a number of studies with transit agencies throughout the country, and these are always the key attributes. It's on-time performance is always the number one at most important attribute, be it here, be it New York City, be it Atlanta, be it Seattle. Now for walking, the, we didn't rate as many attributes. Not, quite as much involved with the infrastructure of <clears throat> walking, obviously. Um, safety, safety crossing the streets is a strength, and we've seen steady improvement in that number since 2006. We've seen also some, num some improvement in the number of sidewalks. And again, these are sidewalks um, both in people, we have both in people's neighborhoods and throughout the county, uh, but it's still a weakness. Your numbers are better than they were, but they're not high enough yet to say it's really helping drive and improve people's overall satisfaction. Now bicycling, what I mentioned to you before about Green Mountain Transit and how these things are all clustering together, we're seeing, we're seeing even more of that with bicycling, where people are, bicycling isn't as important as other things are driving uh, to people's overall satisfaction, but it is important, again, however, not as many people bicycle as drive, not as many people as bicycle as do these other things. So that's why you're seeing everything appear as a weakness. What seems to be occurring is people really like the idea of bicycling, um, but they can, again, separate out what are the key attributes. One area you have shown a great deal of improvement, all that being said, is the number of bike racks. In 2012, only 42% of people were satisfied with the number of bike racks. That number is now up to 61%. It may be one of, maybe even the largest increase in any number throughout this entire study. After we, after we had people rate different attributes, we then started talking about uh, different transportation initiatives, what's important to people, what's not important to people. And we did, a, we did literally dozens of different possible initiatives. And these initiatives uh, went from highway initiatives to safety initiatives to preserving um, your current infrastructure. After we asked people about all these initiatives, we then asked people to say, okay, of all of these different groups of initiatives we've been talking about, what do you think is most important to you? And rather than simply you telling me what's most important, we gave everybody 100 points. You take those 100 points and you divide those 100 points up almost like you were a budget. It's not quite a budget number again, don't divide your budget up this way, please. <laughs> take these 100 points and divide them up to what you would give the most weight to, what's the most important to you. Far and away, the number one thing for people was preserving the condition of what they have, the condition of the roads, bridges, sidewalks. That number has held <clears throat> true since 2006. Each study has not only been the number one thing for people, it has been the number one thing for people by a wide margin. Now, as I said, we asked people to rate dozens and dozens of different possible improvements. We're not going to sit here and go through all those today. I could probably get through them by 10 p.m. if I tried. So instead, uh, what we're gonna do is hit on key things, the things that people really felt are most important. First of those, as we said, preserving existing facilities is, is people's top priority. Within that group, it's fixing bridges that are in poor condition. You remember earlier how poorly rated <clears throat> the condition of bridges was? It shows up here again. Uh, repaving roads, preserving bridges, those things are not only high on people's list of importance, um, they've been trending upwards in terms of people's importance. Again, perceived importance to people. Um, 
repaving road lines, upgrading existing sidewalks are also quite important to people. Okay. Or as bike and walk facilities. These numbers have really held true since 2006. We've seen a little variance. You'll see encouraging development uh, that locates jobs, housing, schools, within walking distance. You'll see a little bit of change there, but really th those are um, not even statistically significant results. Those are could be as much random chance as anything. These numbers felt very stable and really of all the various bike and walk facility questions and improvements we talked about, they're holding quite stable. <clears throat> now in terms of improving safety, um, fixing poor bridges, that same attribute, and that's trending upward since 2006. The remaining attributes we asked about have, are important but have held relatively stable since 2006. When we talk about um, uh, the importance of expanding public transportation services and facilities, real-time information. Um, there's been a huge increase in the interest in looking uh, and receiving real-time bus information. A lot of agencies around the country are facing the same issue and attempting to deal with the same issue. So you are hardly unique in, this, in regards to people's interest or having to, having to tackle this issue. Interestingly, lighting, uh, lighted shelters is also trending upward. Another subject we were talking about. Uh, people see lighted shelters around, they like lighted shelters, so pro probably people uh, would like to see more of them. Even though safety on Green Mountain Transit is, Green Mountain Transit is performing very well in terms of safety, uh, lighted shelters are definitely a safety thing. I, if you ask somebody, would you like a lighted shelter or not, people are more apt than not to say yes. Um, Interesting as well, you've, we've seen a decrease in the number of those who consider uh, having public transit and express transit available to park and ride lots to be essential. Plenty of people consider transportation, uh, uh, public transit to park and ride lots to be important. Not nearly as many consider it to be essential as have in the past. So, yeah, I mean, we're interpreting that uh, not as that people think it's unimportant that we should get rid of uh, transit from other places, but there has been a large increase over the past dozen years in the amount of commuter and Link Express routes. So I think fewer people are saying, oh, this is an important thing we need to add to. People are recognizing we have a pretty robust system in place. So that, that's why we're seeing what we think is the reason for the downward trend in the number of essential votes for those uh, couple of categories. And then in the second block, uh, a similar trend if it was essential to 35% of the folks. Uh, in 2006, but it's dropped by 10% to 2018. Do you maybe also suspect there was a gas price difference from 2006 to 18, or there is no doubt there's gas price difference. Well, the, the 2006 was actually pretty much where it is oh, now. Sorry, 2012, I thought you meant 2012 was the peak. Okay. Um, so that variance, I don't, I don't necessarily have a, a coherent explanation for why that might have dropped from 35 to 23. I mean, there certainly has been development in downtown areas and in village centers. <clears throat> so maybe people perceive that as having been addressed to some extent, or it might just be random variation in and how people answer it. It does seem to match the trend in block three and block five. So I just was curious, they all, I, I would suspect there was a correlation between the three of them. But. Highway initiatives. Um, these all receive lukewarm responses from people. Um, and the interest not only is lukewarm, it's seeming to trend downward. Um, the only one that seems to be still gaining some traction is adding travel lanes to congested roads. And even then, you only have a little over 40% of people who consider it to be very important or essential. Now, the next couple of slides are, well, the next slide, we're going to talk about commuter benefits. We asked people, both what is available to them where they work, and if it's available, <coughs> take advantage of it. What this, by the way, does not show the frequency with which they do things, only they take advantage of it or not. Probably the most interesting number we see on here is those who work in places <coughs> that offer telecommuting. Uh, we're seeing that 37% of people currently work in a place that offers telecommuting. Uh, that's up from 26% in 2012. And not only the 37% of people who work in a place that offers telecommuting, you've got 29% of people who take advantage of telecommuting. So they telecommute some amount. Again, that could be once a month. That could be five days a week. But the 29%, again, is up from 16% in 2012.
the other big numbers you see here, free and subsidized parking, that shouldn't be a surprise. And you do see a slight increase in the amount of people who both receive and take advantage of flex time. In addition to these mode specific attributes, we asked people some questions about general transportation attitudes. These aren't all of them, but these are some key ones that we thought were interesting. 76% have reduced the number of trips that they currently take, or say they've reduced the number of trips they currently take. Rather, they're using the internet for shopping, bills, or for work. That 76% is up from 61% in 2012 and 57% in 2006. So people are definitely, rather than going to the brick and mortar stores, uh, they're shopping online, uh, rather than work, they're telecommuting. Support for um, tax increases, it's increased since 2012. Now, when it comes to tax increases, are a little bit of a funny thing to ask people about. <laughs> I always tell people, or a very funny thing to ask people about, I always tell people when you look at something like this, don't focus on that muddy middle that people say, I somewhat agree or somewhat disagree. Those people on the fence, focus on your extremes. The people who strongly agree or strongly disagree. Those are the people who are, are more sure of their opinion. Um, and this is an interesting, these, there are two findings on here that are, all, that are most interesting when you look at them in conjunction. Currently, if you look at people who strongly agree versus strongly disagree that they would support <coughs> increasing gas taxes to pay for highway, transit, bicycle, and sidewalk projects combined, 25% strongly agree with that versus 28% strongly disagree with that. Why that's interesting? If you separate it and just go highway projects, rather than 25% agree, 28% disagree, it drops to 15% strongly agree, 33% strongly disagree. So you're going from 25 and 28% to 15 and 33%. So if you add in the um, transit, bicycling, and sidewalk projects, you're much more likely to get people's support than going highway alone. All right, in conclusion, uh, first talking about walking. Uh, walking is your strength. 80% of people are satisfied with walking within Chittenden County as a whole. There are opportunities for you to improve, providing enough sidewalks and improving conditions of those sidewalks, leveraging the number of people who can currently walk to work or school or to other places, walkability. Now, the flip side of that is driving. That's a, that's a weakness of the area. 61% of people are satisfied with their, the ability and pleasantness of driving within the county. Your areas to improve there, roads and bridges, obviously, and bridges has come up again and again improving the condition of neighborhood streets as well, <coughs> and reducing traffic congestion, condition and traffic congestion. Now, when we talk about public transportation, there is an opportunity here. There are a lot of people who don't ride, but it definitely improves people's perception of your transportation system, that it's there and that it runs well. Your opportunities for improvement, on-time performance, provide efficient connections, <coughs> operate when needed and where needed. Uh, mode of transportation is only good to me if it can get me where I need to go when I need to get there. And interestingly, providing more bus shelters. Bicycling is an area to watch. 59% um, of people are satisfied, uh, but it's up from, I believe it was 50% in 2012. Your opportunities to improve there. I separated these out, making bicycles safe for children versus making bicycling safe for teens and adults, because obviously those are two somewhat separate issues. Having enough separated bike paths, improving the condition of bike paths, and providing enough bike racks, which is an area you've shown a great deal of improvement, but you're not quite to the point where you can say it's an area of strength. Anyway, that concludes what I was going to share with you today. So if anybody has any questions, we'll do our best to answer them. If we can't answer them today, we'll definitely follow up with you on them. Also, to let everybody know, there will be a much larger, more detailed report out soon. Um, so you will have an opportunity to dive down into numbers if you'd like to. So. Yeah, and to add what Kevin just said, this is sort of a teaser of what's in the report that we're still trying to finalize here. There's a lot more data related to other modes and, and people's attitudes towards those modes that will be in the final report. Yeah. Do, do we do anything pointed in the survey? Uh, I mean, one of the things that and by pointed, I mean any open-ended questions, asking people what would it take to get them out of their single occupancy uh, car tra auto trip? We did ask a few open-ended questions 
comparison they got to the top of my head. I that question actually that <clears throat> I don't think you specifically asked that question. Is that the behavior we're trying to change? Maybe it's a candidate for later surveys. Well, Green Mountain Transit, uh, <clears throat> over the next six months, is going to be doing a public opinion survey. Yeah. Uh, and we do ask questions like that on that survey. Uh -huh. uh, Kevin and I are actually going to be working on yep. that with Green Mountain Transit. And we Have will... we asked those before? And uh, yeah, we got we, answers? What were, what, I'm just curious. What I, were the I you don't know okay. off the top of my head, but uh, we certainly always ask, what are the key factors that would make you more willing to use public transportation? And it's you know things like Kevin said before, better reliability, more service to my town, more hours of service. I can infer that from this. I'm, I mean yeah. something more pointed about what would it take to get you out of your single occupant trip. See, trip. I mean, the answer to that is take away my parking space, but no one <laughs> So what would it take to get me out and still survive afterwards? <laughs> yeah. Brian, do you have more? Yeah, I think it's higher gas prices and eliminate free parking. Mm -hmm. Eliminating free How parking. How high? There's, therein lies the rub. Yeah. Um, there's the whole boil. Four dollars a gallon didn't do it. We're not, it's the whole boil even frog adage. It's if you put a frog in a pot of boiling water, it will jump out where it's slow, put into a pot of cold water and slowly bring up the temperature. Well, people won't, if it goes from 3 to 325 to 350, you have to have a spike in prices to move people. And that's proven not just here, but everywhere. Could you remind me again of the 500 people that, that you talked with? What geographic location were they? Were they um, through? Entire, the entire uh, entirety of Chittenden County. All of Chittenden County. All of Chittenden County. It was a random. What we did was pull a random sample of, of residents and mail. I think it was 8,500. 8, That's why I remember it, but I do remember 8,500 residents were 8,500 households. Yeah. So somebody in Huntington and somebody in the north end, old north end of Burlington. Okay, those are, I'm thinking in my mind, kind of oh, quite you're thinking right. different, different, and it's awfully hard to. I think it'd be more valuable to, to, to talk about the he more heavily populated part of Chittenden County. But I, what we do, and this is this is what you'll see in the report, is we do drill down um, in various subgroups. Um, but one of the subgroups we do drill down into is we separate residents out as city residents, suburban residents, which is a little bit okay. of a money category, and rural okay. residents. Okay. Okay. We'll look at that. Um, I just wanted to for the sake of time. Yeah. And and all the the results were kind of weighted. All based on, so the more <coughs> populous, yeah. you know, it, if we have two-thirds or more of our population are in the urban area, <clears throat> yeah. this kind of reflects that. Yeah. yeah. But when you look at individually, when you look at them individually, we can separate out those two groups to compare differences in attitudes. Uh -huh. so. Dan? I heard what Brian said about raising the, the cost of gas and everything, but that, I mean, all this study is showing is obviously Chittenden County in the, the impression of the residents of Chittenden County taken from a, a, a sample group of 500 people randomly. You've got to look at it as statewide, too. you got to look, and obviously it was a joke about raising, maybe not a joke about raising the cost of gas. It's not practical to go under that premise of raising the price of gas because in these rural communities, when you go up to the Northeast Kingdom, they don't have the opportunity to get on GMT and get so close and get and do that. Cars are a necessary evil in the state. So we got to look statewide. And then the other thing is, I'd like to hear from outside Chittenden County how they feel about that stuff, traveling through that. The, the, the people either in New York that are taken, you know, coming here for work at, at Global Foundries, people from other counties, Washington County, Lamoille County, Addison County, you know, Franklin, that are coming into our county, they're the ones that have to travel and don't have access to mass transit and to be able to bike to work. Those are the people I'd really like to hear from. They're paying state taxes to, to our roads and to help us. So, for what it's worth. Can you mention, I think the state has some sort of public opinion survey that they have done sometimes. I don't know if there's another one coming up or not. I don't. We just did one in 2016. Okay. And we usually do it similar to what you do in advance of doing a major change to our long range plan. So I don't envision that's going to be done probably for another. Three like to, to four have years. a follow up to kind of compare some of the. Yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah. just, I mean, it's a myopic view of, of what we're, we're trying to, to, to address. And I just think we got to look bigger picture here right. beyond, yeah. beyond this. If I could also mention VTRANS is at the beginning stages of its statewide public transit policy plan. 
uh, which I'm managing for them, and we're about to do a large public outreach component. There'll be a meeting uh, hosted at, at CCRPC at the end of November, and we're gonna be doing statewide online survey. There's gonna be a lot of material about this, asking people for their policy priorities and for specific things that can be done to encourage people to use public transportation. So we're gonna be using social media a lot to get the word out for that, and, and certainly working with the RPCs to get as much public engagement as we can on this issue. It's not gonna be very specific to like local routes in Chittenden County. It's more of a statewide perspective, but we are trying to get input on that as well. You are definitely on the right track with doing this. I've been doing this longer than I can admit. I've done more surveys than I can possibly count. I've yet never once done a survey that I've not looked at the result, walked away from it. Darn it, I just wish I'd asked these two more questions. You can never ask enough. Um, so that's why you need to see what other research is out there and be able to look at those results, compare them to what you have. I think it's an excellent idea to see what um, statewide data is available, <coughs> find out from other counties, other parts of the state what's there. Um, there may even be some people are commuting up from New York that have been done down there that might be able to, uh, might be of value. So, or the two-hour questionnaire. <coughs> I, sh I should say, uh, the, the survey that I mentioned is now live. If, if anyone's interested, you could just Google VTrans PTPP, and that'll take you to the page, and then there's a link to this MetroQuest survey. It only takes about five minutes, but it's now live, and, and feel free to, to take a look at it and answer the questions there. Not a random sample, I guess. It's not a random sample. It is not meant to be statistically significant like this survey was. It's just I'm closing I'm, my ears to all of this. <laughs> I'm meant to be public outreach. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get that out if we have it already in our newsletter and, and other ways. One, thing, one analysis that I think would be really interesting is people's perception of infrastructure condition versus what we actually know that Measure. condition to be. Mm -hmm. Whether the perception is consistent with the actual data on that subject. Maybe that's an opportunity. If perception is one thing and the reality is different, maybe there's an education program to try and turn that around. I, I'm just throwing yeah. that out. And we do have data on pavements and bridges and everything, so yep. we can actually do that. We just went through it with the performance measures. Exactly, that's so my point. So we have the actual data, so we can just do that comparison. Okay. Yeah. 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 Think about how to do it. There you go. Yeah, this is big. I don't know when that deadly bridge collapse in Italy or Spain or Spain, <clears> something <throat> a few months ago, and a news event like that, mm -hmm. which is nowhere near here, could affect people's perceptions in answering the survey and said, "Oh my God, there, a bridge collapse. <laughs> that must be a terrible problem here too." <laughs> the reality is, I take all of your residents and stick them in a bubble for a month or so, and just no other outside input. The problem <laughs> is, is that we put a survey out and some event does occur, and it does change people's. Stuff. People's perception infrastructure condition is often how it looks, not how it actually is. And this bridge out here is a great example in Minuski. People perceive it as being really bad because the railing is crumbling and falling apart. But when you actually look at the structural condition of the bridge, it's in phenomenally good structural condition. So it's just an example that, you know. That's a perfect example. It needs to be replaced, though. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think the little bounce uh, also helps you feel uh, it. Uh, 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 Conversely, brand new bridges seem to have collapsed. Yeah. Uh, do you have any idea when we'll be able to see this report? A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Yes, a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, we'll put it, I'll send it out to all of you. I'll put it on the website along with the presentation. And we're kind of finalizing the yeah. final report. Now you said you, you got a breakout between suburban or city results and, and rural. Did you actually do a tally of number of people from each community that uh, responded? We could. Um, what we did do, is for, just so everybody knows, I don't know if we mentioned this or not. Bear with me, I want to make a note. Um, the way this was weighted was weighted by the census tract level. Um, so that we're representative at that point. Um, we can certainly look at community. The one thing we need to be careful of, we have enough residents, suburban, city, suburban, and rural to be able to look at. Um, there are other cases where we tried looking at some numbers. We, there just weren't enough within a specific grouping a specific <coughs> that we could look at. So you may, I, I encourage you, I love it when people use data, um, to ask, hey, can you look at it this, like this? But if we have to come back and say, shoot, we just don't have enough. We can't slice the 500 as fine as we'd like to. 
uh, our policies. So, Kevin, you're saying that if the sample size was larger, that you'd have a, a better take, so that the uh, ends justify the means? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Unquestionably, yes. And I'm going to use that line and take full credit for it. <laughs> Did you say it was 500 out of 8,500 who actually completed it? Correct. 500 out of 8,500 households. 8,500 households. And there was only one person per household that was able to fill that? Correct. But 8,500 people didn't complete it. Only 500, 500. people, but it was mailed to 8,500. 500 completed it. So 8,000 didn't. Right. Right. So was it mail, just mailed once? Or it was, well, we sent out, I just remember, I think we sent out three separate mailings altogether, which came to a total of 8,500. Each individual household, however, received it just once. So it was only via, via postal mail, Correct. not electronic mail? You can't get, well, electronic, um, I don't want to go too, too geeky here, so I'll try to avoid it. I can easily do that. Um, online only sample is not representative. Um, and there's no, you can't randomly generate um, email. I'll look at your own email. See the emails they use, and imagine trying to randomly generate those dark things. Um, so no, it was just uh, done by mail. Anything further? All right, well, thank you very much. We look yeah. forward to the final report. Gives us something to chew on. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda, which is MPO business, is uh, uh, the uh, latest iteration of Transportation Performance Measures Report. So you have a memo in your packet discussing the performance measures as well as the recommended targets for the three uh, FHWA categories, the Infrastructure Commission, pavement and Bridges that we were just talking about, uh, the System Reliability, Travel Time Reliability, as well as the train pavements. So no surprise here, since we discussed it last week, uh, last month when I, we had a presentation on this. Uh, the staff recommendation, as well as the TAC and the executive committee's recommendation is for this board to agree with the statewide targets for all measures under those three categories. So that is our recommendation. I move, a, I move the staff have... and executive committee recommendation. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Okay. Is there? Any further discussion, questions? Dan. Hearing none, one of the best bits of advice I once got as a lawyer is when you're, is if you're winning, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on that, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you very much. Since we're unanimous, we don't need a roll call. Right? Correct. Next item, our fiscal year 2020 municipal dues. Uh, <laughs> nobody wants to talk about this. Um, <laughs> now, um, so uh, this is, uh, we every year look at the dues um, and we have a policy of looking at the employment cost index. <coughs> um, I think it's for New England. So it's kind of the cost of local government employees. Um, and how that goes up uh, and it's been typically going up you know two plus percent or something um, and so if you look at the table attached uh, to this memo you'll see the 2.3 increase and in, in how that breaks out for your town um, but the the bigger picture on dues is um, when we merged for FY 2012 uh, we made a commitment at that time to have three years where we wouldn't raise dues we did that <coughs> then raised dues once 2015 and haven't raised dues since um, and we're looking now at the 2020 uh, fiscal year so we raised dues uh, once in the last eight years so um, uh, given that the uh, staff and the executive committee uh, recommended raising dues for FY20 <coughs> by the 2.3 percent of the formula so yeah, and, and in looking at the table, yeah. Charlie, on the far right, there's a column that says fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20. 
percent change. Does that change include both the annual changes to the grand list value and the 2.3 percent increase? That's so, right. So that is the total net change, including both grand list changes and the proposed percentage increase. Uh, what would result? Right. Yeah. So you know the st simple 2.3. Everybody would have gone up 2.3, but if and you can see here that you know there's a few towns, uh, Burlington, uh, South Burlington, Williston, that had Essex town had much higher than average grand list growth. So theirs are going up over three percent or two, you know, two, three, four percent, and there are even some towns that are going down because their grand list growth was so much lower than the average in the in the county. So. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Yes, Jeff. Is, is there a, a, this is a sources, but is there a uses uh, for these funds uh, issue? Does this just go into the regular operating budget or some of this match, use uh, for matching? Or uh, this is, what? yeah, this is definitely the, you know, the primary use and pretty close to, and I'm, forces behind me, um, so correct, but off the top of my head, I'm going to say pretty close to $200,000 of this goes to matching uh, MPO spending. Um, so the staff work that we do on <clears throat> MPO work is the vast majority of this. Um, the rest may go to towards uh, more. So it's matching, matching, but it's mostly matching funds for actual projects that this assessment is for. Absolutely, yeah. For the in general, the, the UPWP work yep. that is assigned. Okay. Further questions, comments. Seeing none, is there a motion? Move to approve the uh, recommended. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? You guys have it. Next item is the ad hoc committee on commission on Act 250 <laughs> appointments. Uh, so uh, I think. I, kind of tried to give a heads up last month I think um, there is a commission on Act 250 calling the next 50 years uh, that the legislature formed in 2017 they are producing a report December 15 2018 I think um, I'll look at Sharon occasionally I think you're part of the advisors mm -hmm. to that process um, and uh, so the notion and we've had some discussion at the executive committee about this was that we probably should have a committee that's kind of prepared to start looking at what that commission recommends and be able to provide feedback to the legislature as appropriate. It may be, it may be fine. It may be, maybe you should shift here or here. Um, I think excellent last, ad hoc committee. Yeah, so last month, uh, these I think these were the folks that volunteered, and Tony, the, I am correct. Andy, you almost volunteered. I think. I think I did. Almost. <laughs> Justin and Chris. Uh, Jim's not here, but I'm pretty sure he did. So I guess the question, uh, is there anybody else that really is dying to dive into this subject? Um, or, or even if they're not, not dying, if they're just interested. <laughs> 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 sure. Alternates can do this as well. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Alternates can serve on any one of our committees, yeah. and we encourage them to serve. In fact, they can head the committees. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, for like Deb Ingram from Williston, yeah, yeah public participation. A better way to get to know what we do than serve on a committee, because we're a committee organization. And this is not, you know, the old, I wouldn't be a member of any club that would accept me as a member. <clears throat> um, this, if somebody uh, becomes interested in participating, yeah. please let us know. There's always going to be the opportunity to participate either informally or as a, uh, as a member of the committee. What's the deadline to have this? The commission is going to produce recommendations by December 15th. Of this year? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What action are you looking for us besides volunteering? I mean, it's the it's within the jurisdiction of the chair to appoint ad hoc committees, right? Uh, with the concurrence of the, or with, of the board. Yeah. So we have to, like, say it's okay? You know, it was the old or, motion to I concur would move, the We move the slate of volunteers. Is there a second? I'll second. I didn't realize we had to have the chair hamstrung on ad hoc committees. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All told say nay, I'll take that as concurrence. <laughs> and we'll move on to item nine, which is the Winooski Tactical Basin Plan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so Dan Albrecht, uh, RPC staff here, and with me is Karen Bates from Vermont DEC, here to answer any questions. Um, the, um, as I presented at the, your prior meeting, the DEC has been working with our RPC and residents as well as other RPCs upstream and, and watershed groups and other individuals on crafting the Winooski Tactical Basin Plan update. It's quite a uh, significant uh, upgrade or expansion of the older basin plans in light of DEC's uh, strengthened commitment to, to water quality and the increased amount of funding, and especially because of Lake Champlain phosphorus issues. So the whole issue that I talked about last time of the, the TMDL and tracking these improvements and using the basin plans as a vehicle by which the TMDLs are to be achieved. So again, a very comprehensive document. Um, so at the last meeting, I walked through the various uh, elements of the plan, the, the stressors, we talked about stormwater and ag and roads, uh, and then the strategies that come from those plan, and then the RPC role. We're now here at the tonight at the culmination of the RPC role, which is in addition, of course, into providing input into the plan, which uh, we've done at the staff level and through our Clean Water Advisory Committee. Uh, we're now at, at the, the primary um, purpose at the end is, is to uh, deliver a letter to DEC um, on the conformance of the basin plan with uh, the regional plan. So this draft here was worked through the Clean, Clean Water Advisory Committee and the uh, Executive Committee also looked at it and as noted in the memo both the committees recommended adoption of the letter. So I won't go into detail but I will hit the highlights here. Um, so the first page just gives you that sure, track. Can we just get the yeah. highlights of what changed from the last month? Uh, the, well, the letter is, is the letter is, is, is new. The letter is new. Yes. But it reflects the comments? It re reflects the, the, the comments. Are there and the, any substantive changes to the comments that we received last month? Uh, well, no, but this is really the first sort of look at, at the detail of, of the letter. We, we did, I did talk about the strategies, but in terms of that. So it, 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 won't, it won't be long. Um, so again, page one just outlines the background and why we do this. So um, beginning in page two, what we really do is just highlight, okay, there's the basin plan top objectives and strategies, which I outlined, and what goals and strategies in our ECOS plan do they link, do they link to. So as you can see, uh, many of the strategies, page two, page three, um, and, into, uh, and into four, um, they link oftentimes to our, st our strategy number three, um, which is improving the safety, water quality, and habitat of our rivers, streams, uh, wetlands, and lakes in each watershed um, with, with quite a lot of detail. Um, and there's some linkage as well to um, strategy four in, in, for, um, with regards to forest blocks and, uh, and other habitat. Um, so on page four, our the letter uh, affirms that the, the, the draft basin plan is in conformance with and supportive of our 2018 ECOS plan. Um, as I referenced earlier, um, we making additional recommendations uh, following on many of the recommendations we made on the 2016 Lamoille Basin Plan, uh, which is another significant portion of our uh, county. We have the Lamoille Basin in the northern portion, Winooski Basin in the central, uh, and, and southern, and then what's called the direct to lake small streams that drain straight into Lake Champlain as opposed to part of the bigger river systems. And that'll be coming up in the next two years. So again, we make recommendations regarding prioritization on, on phosphorus removal. And then we're, uh, we're trying to work with DEC on a, on a way to categorize co-benefits uh, similar to the TPI process, so hazard mitigation or transportation improvement. So you fix a major bridge that carries a lot of traffic, you know, at the same time you aid the water quality and stop erosion. So that adds a benefit. Um, 
we do make a, a, a pretty strong statement in number two that some strategies are more important than others. If, if phosphorus is really the goal and the TMDL is staring us in the face for these next 20 some years, then, then the plan should really say that. So yes, invasives is a concern. We don't want to forget about it. But if, if, if we really have this 800 pound gorilla in the room, let's, let's note the fact of that um, uh, 800 pound gorilla and recognize that some strategies are more important than others. Um, and then comments regarding you know, some, some realism or how many of these projects are really going to be done in the next five years with additional recommendation number three. Um, continued emphasis on also some funds for project development. There's, as I mentioned, there's well over a thousand projects in the watershed projects database. There's a lot of projects that have been identified but have not been visited by an engineer or a river scientist or checking in with the landowner like, would you even want somebody to plant trees next to this stream or fix this culvert or move this road or whatever? So, um, and then lastly, a, a strong, a strong. Uh, emphasis and, on page five and six on the need to recognize that spending millions of dollars at a rate of roughly you know forty five million dollars a ton to get that t one ton of phosphorus out of our sewer plants is not really cost effective um, and so there needs to be a, a recognition of that that that's Yes, improvements, upgrades, uh, improved maintenance, gradual upgrades, yes, can certainly be helpful. But if we're going to focus the growth in the areas with our services, with our wastewater, then we need, we need to recognize that, that uh, causing uh, or requiring significant expenditures of, of funding just to chase another ton of phosphorus when you could much better spend that money somewhere else to get to get the best bang for the buck. Um, so that's how the letter concludes. And as I say, we'll make some minor staff comments on formatting or other uh, additional recommendations. But this is the letter, which if you guys adopt it, will be transmitted to the secretary tomorrow. Dan, on the table on page five, there's a list of various sectors. Mm -hmm. What's encompassed by the natural resources sector? It's like what kind of, I mean, I understand agriculture, stormwater, and pollution control infrastructure. What's encompassed within I'm that? I'm going to turn that over to Karen. So that would be enhancing the, the resources that actually help to reduce phosphorus loading or um, either through uh, wetlands where you actually have storm water that might sit in the wetland and phosphorus drops out, or especially in ag fields, our old ag fields, and then uh, floodplain expansion or re restoration so that the river can expand into a floodplain instead of maybe downstream providing more damage and more erosion. Those are the two resources that are protected by the most. The other might be the, those river corridor protections <coughs> in, you know, tree planting and conservation. Any further questions, comments? Yep, Andrea. Um, I guess by, by default, the natural resources thing is kind of talking about prevention. And it feels like <coughs> that I just was looking for that word prevention anywhere in the letter. Um, from us, because it is a, a significant uh, way in which we can address this, and um, just wondered if there's an opportunity to. Um, we add do. We do recognize the protection. The very first strategy, yes, protect I saw river that. corridors. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we're, I, I see your point. On the other hand, what we're trying to do this letter is, to some extent, check the box to look at the document. Does it conform? Yeah. You know, so I, I see what you're but saying. It, you know, just trying to reinforce the idea that, you know, an ounce of prevention is really good. Um, yeah, Jeff? I know this is collaborative, but um, what does ANR do with this after we send it? So this information that we receive during the comment period, we respond to. So we will take every question. Sometimes we'll bundle them if it's the same thing. And then respond with a. Uh, so it's a, a normal, a normal party public involvement process. Yes, right. Okay. Exactly. And we're in the middle of it now with comments accepted through 4:30 p.m. on October 31st mm -hmm. to Karen. So. Oh. So is there going to be another iteration that's going to be put out for comment, or no. is there is this 
when you decide what you're going to do, that that's right. what the end thing is going to be. Okay. Yeah, it goes to the secretary. The secretary has to approve the plan, I think, by the end of December. Yeah. So there's not a lot of time for more process. There will be a responsiveness summary, though, of some Right. Point. So yeah. the response, we, we will we'll print it, and it will be at the end added to the basic plan itself. Is there enough time for us to respond to the response? Uh, no, and there's not a process either. No. So well, What they do typically in these responsiveness service summaries is they go through the comments and they either will point out how it was already addressed, um, changes that have been made to further address it, or why they don't think I, any changes. This is this is more this is a, yeah this is a little bit different because this is a big ticket item going forward right. and so that's why I was asking. Right. <clears throat> Any other questions comments? Hearing none, is there a motion? Make a motion that we uh, approve the letter and send it to the A and I to the secretary. To the secretary. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Okay. Number 10, Executive Director Report. Um, so just uh, really just provide a little follow-up and update. Um, we did, the <coughs> governor brought his cabinet up to Chittenden County a couple weeks ago now. You may have seen some mentions in the news about that. Um, there were a few things that uh, RPC staff were involved with. We had a meeting with Secretary Flynn. Um, there was another meeting with uh, a bunch of the commerce leadership in Winooski. Um, the commissioner of the Department of Public Service met with us to talk about the energy planning work. Um, so it was kind of nice for them to bring state agency leadership up to the uh, up to Chittenden County and have some good conversations. And from what I could tell, it looked like the uh, agency leadership got something out of it too. So. Um, uh, the building homes together uh, results you'll see uh, there's a couple pieces of paper in front of you um, and uh, thanks to Emma for the, the stuff that looks pretty um, uh, you get uh, some graphs about the <coughs> production um, I think we hi had a press conference on this was that last week sorry time, time flies when I'm having fun um, in, it looks like there was a big drop in housing production in 2017. We did 954 homes in 2016, 659 in 2017. The one thing that 2017 doesn't include is that UVM you know, tore down the, I think the shoe boxes and built new dorms. So they actually added 300 beds. We just don't have a good way to convert that into housing units. Um, but that also got added. The vacancy rate, even though it was ticking up, going back to 2016, Looks like, based on the snapshot surveys that Alan and Brooks do, that it's ticking back down. So, uh, kind of watching that still. Um, and then on the flip side, you'll see that uh, the affordable housing goal, uh, we should be at 280 homes. We're at 191, so not quite meeting that 20% of the new units being permanently affordable. Um, and at the bottom is kind of a call for um, uh, more housing, local housing trust funds, uh, more full funding for VHCB, and um, zoning changes and other things that we've been working with municipalities. So, um, also a, a kind of a credit to Regina. The I don't think this is on here, but there's a housing convening coming up October 29th. Um, and I think with a focus on trust funds, right? The housing <coughs> trust funds. So. Um, so she's been in touch. You may have all seen emails from uh, Regina about that. Um, but uh, as I've gone around to the, your select boards, and that's one of the things that you know, people have remarked on that those have been good. So thank you for putting those together. Um, you also have the press release that went out. Um, so remind me again. Yep. Homes equals units. Yep. And you can't use units because that interferes with your nice slogan. <laughs> building units together <laughs> well but I mean you know we're creating the impression like an apartment unit is a home yep okay with a white picket fence and a it is a home for somebody it is no it's not it's a housing unit the home is what you make it not not the physical <laughs> unit <laughs> after you move in <laughs> yeah so um and the other thing uh so this is not answering your question. It's okay. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, 
is uh, there is a lot on, uh, that's kind of under construction in 2018 and probably 2019. We may have an even larger number, uh, with particularly Cambrian Rise, and depending on how fast uh, the former wall moves forward. But uh, anyway, so uh, we're just w watching all that. Uh, Public Utility Commission. Can I ask a quick yeah, question sorry. on the housing? Sure. Um, you say permanently affordable, and I've sort of forgotten how that was managed how do you uh, that's uh, really stuff that predominantly Champlain Housing Trust manages or owns uh, maybe some with Cathedral Square so the 191 are going to have some link to Cathedral Square or Champlain Housing Trust probably mostly Champlain Housing Trust yep and, and so we're pretty secure with some yep are there any other opportunities to make things permanently affordable outside of those two organizations the other category is inclusionary zoning units in the city of Burlington which is a bit of a... It's a 99-year by fiat of zoning requirement, so it it walk it d doesn't have the nonprofit management, but it has the financial restrictions. Okay. And have we actually got any of those, or are they just paying for the... Yeah, 15 to 25 percent of the units in a private project uh, at a time. So the mall had a higher target, um, self-imposed. Um, the majority of wor workforce housing projects that are privately developed fall into the lower uh, requirement of 15 percent in total. That's good to hear because I had heard the developers tended to just pay the penalty and you know go ahead and charge the market rate. Yeah, that that doesn't make financial sense. Uh, the the last project I think that happened with the in lieu of was the uh, the West Lake, and yeah. that was a, a one off uh, settlement I believe. I think that's right. So going forward, Burlington sort of made it so that yeah, they tightened up. Yes. Okay. How is it enforced? Um, it's a zoning condition, zone. and uh, you don't get a certificate of occupancy until you demonstrate that you've uh, offered them. And, and there's a process where you have to offer the units first or make them known that they're available to Champlain Housing Trust so that oh, they can okay. assist in, in uh, making that opportunity available to folks on that list. So it's linked to their, their list? There's a notification requirement. It's not part of their managed portfolio. And you don't get your zoning permit unless you include that in, as part of the project? Anything else? Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, just uh, this is an FYI. The Public Utility Commission has been, um, uh, from my view, pretty interesting. They've been opening up um, a number of cases just to kind of get input on issues. Uh, so it's not that they got like a formal application, but um, <coughs> so they've been taking input on electric vehicles um, and uh, energy efficiency. So. Um, I think they all will report back to the legislature on electric vehicles by July. So anyway, we're kind of at least monitoring and may, you know, offer some comments um, since we spent all that work on energy planning over the last year and a half. So um, just so you're aware of that, um, you know, anything we submit to them will be consistent with the plan that we put together. Um, and then finally, legislative breakfast. Um, I think. We still have a, another month, uh, another board meeting before the legislative breakfast. Um, but one to, well, number one, get it on your calendar. On the back of the agenda, you'll see December 11th, 7.30 to 9 a.m. at Trader Duke's Hotel. The old, old double tree, but still Trader Duke's. Where we shared with the bankers last year. Yes. Not this year. Emma has worked very hard to make sure we are not sharing our breakfast. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with sharing, yeah. but I think it was a little hard for That's the legislators. down on the legislators. Yeah, place. it was hard uh, for them to pick and choose. Um, so you can uh, put that on your calendar. And then, um, you know, I think we have some topics that we have been kind of routinely talking to them about, you know, whether it's kind of the water quality issues and, and uh, funding, uh, housing, uh, transportation investment, uh, probably one thing uh, I want to make sure they're at least aware of and maybe talk about is the 89 study, which will be starting up in 2019, is going to be a, a big deal for us. Um, and then, of course, what comes out of the Act 250 Commission, which we won't know by that breakfast, mm -hmm. but uh, kind of a heads up that we have an interest in providing them some input on that. But um, other any other things that you think we should be addressing with our legislators at that breakfast money money money
Uh, you know, all those things are somehow connected to money, but I was trying to be subtle. Um, so if you do have any thoughts, you know, feel free to call or email me. Or uh, we'll, we'll probably we're going to update our contribution to state coffers data and things like that, so we can yeah, just remind them. I was again. kind of looking at that. We do <clears throat> have uh, we have presented them some of you know kind of our our part of the state's economy picture. Um, you know, could review that quickly again, or at least have a handout on that. Mm -hmm. It's always good to remind them. Yeah, that nobody has gotten too mad at me for that yet, so that's good. Well, no, in fact, we're, we're talking to the Chittenden County legislators, so. Well, and we've heard a lot in the news where they talk about stagnant growth outside of Chittenden County. Yep. And so there's been a lot of focus on that. And I think the reciprocal focus should also be emphasized, which is, yes, and in the meantime, you know, don't kill the golden goose here. You've got one area that's that's generating growth and generating revenues for all of your state programs. So we need to continue to uh, encourage responsible economic growth in Chittenden County while the rest of the state strategizes how to get them out of the muck as far as growth goes. Mr. Chair, I'm believing that there has been an inflection point which has moved in the negative direction. Uh, because of trouble with some of our economic drivers in Northwest Vermont. Mm -hmm. And so it may be worthwhile to point out to them that uh, we haven't had the best last year or so. <clears throat> may follow up with, with you on okay. that. We, we have layoffs in higher education, and um, we've had some right sizing at some of our major manufacturers and uh, those types of things. And I think if you look at the trend data, it's not a pretty picture. Which goes to the point that you just can't assume that it's always going to be there without which is uh, I believe starting to have a statewide impact <clears throat> um, and then the last thing I'll say is just uh, you'll see uh, at the back is uh, what we have for the upcoming meetings so just heads up on that and well, attached to your packet are various committee reports and minutes are there any members items or other business to be raised Yes, um, I noticed the response on the um, UVM Gutterson complex expansion, and um, I just wondered whether there was ever any discussion about how <coughs> to um, use that area for better connectivity uh, between, you know, Prospect Street and Spear Street, and still it can be a pedestrian campus, but not have the convoluted ways that one has to get around there. And that that, you know, whether anybody ever talked about that. You go back to the old days when you could cut across. <laughs> no, we have not, and to be honest with you, we really have not really gotten involved with the site planning aspect mm -hmm. of these because we're commenting at, you know, a couple minutes before midnight in these projects. That particular project relates to you, right now you have Patrick, Jim, and Gutterson, and there's a little parking area that sticks in, and they're going to be filling in there with a new basketball court events that is, it was going to have the same seating capacity as the current Patrick, Jim, but it's going to be an upgrade in facilities, and they're going to share some, some, uh, some suites or whatever up at the top. And then the existing Patrick, Jim, it's going to be more multi-use space but so that project is really limited to the the footprint of that project and was within they have a global um, parking requirement that they have to stay within and so that's it's within that we did ask some questions about was this going to increase the capacity of the facility and was that going to create any traffic impacts and we did have some back and forth on that but that was the issue we were most yeah, so I'll just mention I'm the Sustainable Transportation Coordinator at EVM. Um, <laughs> so, so you're on the hot seat. <laughs> no, that's a great question, but um, the, when that facility was built out, athletic um, campus, deeded isn't the right word, but um, we were required to sign a document that said forever <laughs> we will not put any additional traffic on to Spear Street or Prospect, and that's why there's that heinous way of navigating through that part of campus but where our hands are tied with the ability to change that traffic pattern. Okay. But I wish we could too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Any other other business? <laughs>
Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you very much, folks. We, uh, have a happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you the week after that. <laughs> what do you think?